Something Wonderful by Judith McNaught Chapter 1 The voluptuous blonde woman lifted up on an elbow and pulled a sheet to her breasts. Frowning slightly, she studied the darkly handsome youth of eighteen who was standing at the window of his bedchamber, his shoulder propped against the window frame, looking out across the back lawns, where a party in honor of his mother's birthday was in progress. What do you see that interests you more than I? Lady Catherine Harrington asked as she wrapped the sheet around herself and walked over to the window. Jordan Addison Matthew Townsend, the future Duke of Hawthorne, seemed not to hear her as he looked out across the grounds of the palatial estate that would, upon his father's death, become his. As he gazed at the hedge maze below, he saw his mother emerge from the shrubbery. Casting a brief, furtive look about her, she straightened the bodice of her dress and smoothed her heavy dark hair into some semblance of order. A moment later Lord Harrington emerged, reeking his neckcloth. Their laughter drifted up through Jordan's open window as they linked arms. Mild cynicism marred the youthful handsomeness of his lean features as Jordan watched his mother and her newest love across the lawns and saunter into the arbor. A few moments later, his father emerged from the same hedge maze, looked about him, then retrieved Lady Melbourne, his current paramour, from the bushes. Evidently my mother has acquired a new lover, Jordan drawled sarcastically. Really? Lady Harrington asked, peering out the window. Who? Your husband. Turning fully toward her, Jordan studied her lovely face, searching for some sign of surprise. When he saw none, his own features hardened into an ironic mask. You knew they were in the maze together, and that accounts for your sudden, unprecedented interest in my bed, is that it? She nodded, uneasy under the relentless gaze of those cool grey eyes. I thought, she said, running her hand up his hard chest, it would be amusing if we were also to, you, get together. But my interest in your bed isn't sudden, Jordan. I've wanted you for a long time. Now that your mother and my husband are enjoying each other, I saw no reason not to take what I wanted. Where's the harm in that? He said nothing and her eyes searched his inscrutable features, her smile coy. Are you shocked? Hardly, he replied. I've known about my mother's affairs since I was eight years old, and I doubt I could be shocked by what any woman does. If anything, I'm surprised you didn't contrive for all six of us to meet in the maze for a little family get-together, he finished with deliberate insolence. She made a muffled sound, part laughter, part horror. Now you've shocked me. Lazily he reached out and tipped her chin up, studying her face with eyes too hard, too knowledgeable for his years. Somehow I find that impossible to believe. Suddenly embarrassed, Catherine pulled her hand from his chest and wrapped the sheet more securely around her nakedness. Really, Jordan, I don't see why you're looking at me as if I'm beneath contempt, she said, her face reflecting honest bewilderment and a little pique. You aren't married, so you don't realize how insufferably dull life is for all of us. Without dalliance to take one's mind off the tedium, we would all go quite mad. At the tragic note in her voice, humor softened his features and his firm, sensual lips quirked in a derisive smile. Poor little Catherine, he said dryly, reaching out and brushing his knuckles against her cheek. What a miserable lot you women have. From the day you're born, anything you want is yours for the asking, and so you have nothing to work for, and even if you did, you'd never be permitted to work for it. We don't allow you to study and your forbidden sports so you cannot exercise your mind or your body. You don't even have honor to cling to, for although a man's honor is his for as long as he wishes, yours is between your legs, and you lose it to the first man who has you. How unjust life is to you. He finished. No wonder you're all so bored, amoral, and frivolous. Catherine hesitated, struck by his words, not certain whether he was ridiculing her, then shrugged. You're absolutely right. He looked at her curiously. Did it ever occur to you to try to change all that? No, she admitted bluntly. I applaud your honesty. It's a rare virtue in your sex, 
Although he was only 18, Jordan Townsend's potent attraction for women was already a topic of much scintillating feminine gossip, and as Catherine gazed into those cynical grey eyes, she suddenly felt herself drawn to him as if by some overwhelming magnetic force. Understanding was in his eyes, along with a touch of humour and hard knowledge far beyond his years. It was these things, even more than his dark good looks and blatant virility, that impelled women toward him. Jordan understood women, he understood her, and although it was obvious he didn't admire or approve of her, he accepted her for what she was, with all her weaknesses. Are you coming to bed, my lord? No, he said mildly. Why? Because I find I'm not quite bored enough to want to sleep with the wife of my mother's lover. You don't you don't have a very high opinion of women, do you? Catherine asked because she couldn't stop herself. Is there any reason I should? I, she bit her lip and then reluctantly shook her head. No. I suppose not. But someday you'll have to marry in order to have children. His eyes suddenly glinted with amusement, and he leaned back against the window frame, crossing his arms over his chest. Marry? Really? Is that how one gets children? And all this time, I thought. Jordan, really? She said, laughing, more than a little enthralled by this relaxed, teasing side of him. You'll need a legitimate heir. When I'm forced to pledge my hand in order to produce an heir, he replied with grim humor, I'll choose a naive chit right out of the schoolroom who'll leap to do my merest bidding. And when she becomes bored and seeks other diversion, what will you do? Will she become bored? He inquired in a steely voice. Catherine studied his broad, muscular shoulders, deep chest, and narrow waist, then her gaze lifted to his ruggedly hewn features. In a linen shirt and tight-fitting riding breeches, every inch of Jordan Townsend's tall frame positively radiated raw power and leashed sensuality. Her brows lifted over knowing green eyes. Perhaps not. While she dressed, Jordan turned back to the windows and gazed dispassionately at the elegant guests who had gathered on the lawns at Hawthorne to celebrate his mother's birthday. To an outsider on that day, Hawthorne doubtless looked like a fascinating, lush paradise populated by beautiful, carefree, tropical birds parading in all their gorgeous finery. To 18-year-old Jordan Townsend, the scene held little interest and no beauty, he knew too well what went on within the walls of this house when the guests were gone. At eighteen, he did not believe in the inherent goodness of anyone, including himself. He had breeding, looks, and wealth, he was also world-weary, restrained, and guarded. With her small chin propped upon her fists, Miss Alexandra Lawrence watched the yellow butterfly perched upon the windowsill of her grandfather's cottage, then she turned her attention back to the beloved white-haired man seated across the desk from her. What did you say, grandfather? I didn't hear you. I asked why that butterfly is more interesting than Socrates today, the kindly old man said, smiling his gentle scholar's smile at the petite thirteen-year-old who possessed her mother's glossy chestnut curls and his own blue-green eyes. Amused, he tapped the volume of Socrates' works from which he had been instructing her. Alexandra sent him a melting, apologetic smile, but she didn't deny that she was distracted, for as her gentle, scholarly grandfather oft said, a lie is an affront to the soul as well as an insult to the intelligence of the person to whom one lies. And Alexandra would have done anything rather than insult this gentleman who had instilled her with his own philosophy of life, as well as educating her in mathematics, philosophy, history, and Latin. I was wondering, she admitted with a wistful sigh, if there's the slightest chance that I'm only in the caterpillar stage just now, and someday soon I'll change into a butterfly and be beautiful? What's wrong with being a caterpillar? After all, he quoted, teasing, nothing is beautiful from every point of view. His eyes twinkled as he waited to see if she could recognize the quotation's source. Horace, Alexandra provided promptly, smiling back at him. He nodded, pleased, then he said, you needn't worry about your appearance, my dear, because true beauty springs from the heart and dwells in the eyes. Alexandra tipped her head to the side, 
thinking, but she could not recall any philosopher, ancient or modern, who had said such a thing. Who said that? Her grandfather chuckled. I did. Her answering laughter tinkled like bells, filling the sunny room with her musical gaiety, then she abruptly sobered. Papa is disappointed I'm not pretty. I can see it whenever he comes to visit. He has every reason to expect me to turn out better, for Mama is beautiful and, besides being handsome, Papa is also fourth cousin to an earl, by marriage. Barely able to conceal distaste for his son-in-law and for his dubious claim to an obscure connection to an obscure earl, Mr. Jimble quoted meaningfully, birth is nothing where virtue is not. Molly Eyre. Alexandra automatically named the source of the quotation. But, she continued glumly, reverting to her original concern, you must admit it is excessively unkind of faith to give him a daughter who is so very common looking. Why, she went on morosely, could I not be tall and blonde? That would be so much nicer than looking like a little gypsy, which papa says I do. She turned her head to contemplate the butterfly again and Mr. Jimble's eyes shone with fondness and delight, for his granddaughter was anything but common. When she was a child of four, he had begun instructing Alexandra in the fundamentals of reading and writing, exactly as he'd instructed the village children entrusted to his tutelage, but Alex's mind was more fertile than theirs, quicker and more able to grasp concepts. The children of the peasants were indifferent students who came to him for only a few years and then went out into the fields of their fathers to labor, to wed, to reproduce, and begin the life cycle all over again. But Alex had been born with his own fascination for learning. The elderly man smiled at his granddaughter. The cycle was not such a bad thing, he thought. Had he followed his own youthful inclinations and remained a bachelor, devoting all his life to study, rather than marrying, Alexandra Lawrence would never have existed. And Alex was a gift to the world. His gift. The thought uplifted and then embarrassed him because it reeked of pride. Still, he couldn't stem the rush of pleasure that flowed through him as he looked at the curly-haired child seated across from him. She was everything he hoped she'd be, and more. She was gentleness and laughter, intelligence and indomitable spirit. Too much spirit, perhaps and too much sensitivity as well, for she repeatedly turned herself inside out, trying to please her shallow father during his occasional visits. He wondered what sort of man she would marry, not such a one as his own daughter had wed, he devoutly hoped. His own daughter lacked Alexandra's depth of character, he had spoiled her, Mr. Jimble thought sadly. Alexandra's mother was weak and selfish. She had married a man exactly like herself, but Alex would need, and deserve, a far better man. With her usual sensitivity, Alexandra noticed the sudden darkening of her grandfather's mood and strove immediately to lighten it. Are you feeling unwell, Grandpapa? The headache again? Shall I rub your neck? I do have a bit of the headache, Mr. Jimble said, and as he dipped his quill in the inkpot, forming the words that would someday become a complete dissertation on the life of Voltaire, she came around behind him and began with her child's hands to soothe away the tension in his shoulders and neck. No sooner had her hands stilled than he felt the tickle of something brush against his cheek. Absorbed in his work, he reached up and absently rubbed his cheek where it tickled. A moment later, his neck tickled and he rubbed it there. The tickle switched to his right ear and he bit back an exasperated smile as he finally realized his granddaughter was brushing a feather quill against his skin. Alex, my dear, he said, I fear there's a mischievous little bird in here, diverting me from my labors. Because you work too hard, she said, but she pressed a kiss against his parchment cheek and returned to her seat to study Socrates. A few moments later, her lagging attention was diverted by a worm inching its way past the open door of the thatched cottage. If everything in the universe serves God's special purpose, why do you suppose he created snakes? They're ever so ugly. Quite gruesome, actually. Sighing at her interruption, Mr. Jimble laid down his quill, but he was not proof against her sunny smile. I shall make it a point to ask God about that when I see him.
The idea of her grandfather dying made Alexandra instantly somber, but the sound of a carriage drawing up before the cottage caused her to leap to her feet, running to the open window. It's Papa. She burst out joyously. Papa has come from London at last. And about time it is, too, Mr. Jimble grumbled, but Alex didn't hear. Clad in her favorite garb of breeches and peasant shirt, she was racing through the doorway and hurtling herself into her father's reluctant arms. How are you, little gypsy? He said without much interest. Mr. Jimble arose and went to the window, watching with a frown as the handsome Londoner helped his daughter up into his fancy new carriage. Fancy carriage, fancy clothes, but his morals were not fancy at all, thought Mr. Jimble angrily recalling how his daughter, Felicia, had been blinded by the man's looks and suavity from the moment he had arrived at their cottage one afternoon, his carriage broken down in the road in front of it. Mr. Jimble had offered to let the man spend the night and, late in the afternoon, against his better judgment, he had yielded to Felicia's pleading and allowed her to walk out with him so she might show him the pretty view from the hill above the stream. When darkness fell and they had not returned, Mr. Jimble struck out after them, finding his way easily by the light of the full moon. He discovered them at the foot of the hill, beside the stream, naked in each other's arms. It had taken George Lawrence less than four hours to convince Felicia to abandon the precepts of a lifetime and to seduce her. Rage beyond anything he had ever known had boiled up inside Mr. Jimberland, without a sound, he had left the scene. When he returned to the cottage two hours later, he was accompanied by his good friend the local vicar. The vicar was carrying the book from which he would read the marriage ceremony. Mr. Jimble was carrying a rifle to make certain his daughter's seducer participated in the ceremony. It was the first time in his life he had ever held a weapon. And what had his righteous fury gotten for Felicia? The question darkened Mr. Jimble's features. George Lawrence had bought her a large, run-down house that had been vacant for a decade, provided her with servants, and for nine months following their marriage, he had reluctantly lived with her here in the remote little shire where she had been born. At the end of that time Alexandra arrived, and soon afterward George Lawrence went back to London, where he stayed, returning to Morshm only twice each year for two or three weeks. He is earning a living in the best way he knows how. Felicia had explained to Mr. Jimble, obviously repeating what her husband had told her. He's a gentleman and therefore cannot be expected to work for a living like ordinary men. In London, his breeding and connections enable him to mingle with all the right people, and from them he picks up hints now and then about good investments on the change, and which horses to bet on at the races. It's the only way he can support us. Naturally. He would like to have us with him in London, but it is dreadfully expensive and the city, and he would not dream of subjecting us to the sort of cramped, dingy lodgings he must live in there. He comes to us as often as he can. Mr. Jimble was dubious about George Lawrence's explanation for preferring to remain in London, but he had no doubt why the man returned to Morsham twice each year. He did so because Mr. Jimble had promised to seek him out in London, with his borrowed rifle, if he did not return at least that often to see his wife and daughter. Nevertheless, there was no point in wounding Felicia with the truth, for she was happy. Unlike the other women in the tiny shire, Felicia was married to a true gentleman and that was all that counted in her foolish estimation. It gave her status, and she walked among her neighbors with a queenly air of superiority. Like Felicia, Alexandra worshipped George Lawrence, and he basked in their unquestioning adoration during his brief visits. Felicia fussed over him, and Alex tried valiantly to be both son and daughter to him, worrying about her lack of feminine beauty at the same time she wore breeches and practiced fencing so she could fence with him whenever he came. Standing in the window, Mr. Jimble glowered at the shiny conveyance drawn by four sleek, prancing horses. For a man who could spare little money for his wife and daughter, George Lawrence drove a very expensive carriage and team. How long can you stay this time, Papa? Alexandra said, already beginning to dread the inevitable time when he would leave again.
only a week. I'm off to the Lansdowne's place in Kent. Why must you be gone so much? Alexandra asked, unable to hide her disappointment even though she knew he, too, hated to be away from her and her mother. Because I must, he said, and when she started to protest, he shook his head and reached into his pocket, extracting a small box. Here, I've brought you a little present for your birthday, Alex. Alexandra gazed at him with adoration and pleasure, despite the fact that her birthday had come and gone months before, without so much as a letter from him. Her aquamarine eyes were shining as she opened the box and removed a small, silver-colored locket shaped like a heart. Although it was made of tin and not particularly pretty, she held it in her palm as if it were infinitely precious. I shall wear it every single day of my life, Papa, she whispered, then she put her arms around him in a fierce hug. I love you so much. As they passed through the tiny sleepy village, the horses sent puffs of dust up into the air, and Alexandra waved at the people who saw her, eager for them to know that her wonderful, handsome Papa had returned. She needn't have bothered to call their attention to him. By evening, everyone in the village would be discussing not only his return, but the color of his coat, and a dozen other details, for the village of Morsham was as it had been for hundreds of years, sleepy, undisturbed, forgotten in its remote valley. Its inhabitants were simple, unimaginative, hard-working folk who took immeasurable pleasure in recounting any tiny event that occurred to alleviate the endless sameness of their existence. They were still talking about the day, three months ago, when a carriage came through with a city fellow wearing a coat of not just one gate but eight. Now they would have George Lawrence's wondrous carriage and team to discuss for the next six months. To an outsider, Morsh might seem a dull place populated by gossipy peasants, but to thirteen-year-old Alexandra, the village and its inhabitants were beautiful. At thirteen she believed in the inherent goodness of each of God's children and she had no doubt that honesty, integrity, and cheerfulness were common to all mankind. She was gentle, gay, and incurably optimistic. Chapter 2 The Duke of Hawthorne slowly lowered his arm the smoking pistol still in his hand, and gazed dispassionately at the grumpled figure of Lord Grangerfield lying motionless on the ground. Jealous husbands were a damned nuisance, Jordan thought, almost as troublesome as their vain and frivolous wives. Not only did they frequently leap to totally unwarranted conclusions, but they also insisted on discussing their delusions at dawn with pistols. His impassive gaze still resting on the elderly, wounded opponent, who was being tended by the physician and seconds, he cursed the beautiful, scheming young woman whose relentless pursuit of him had caused this duel. At twenty-seven, Jordan had long ago decided that dallying with other men's wives often resulted in more complications than any sexual gratification was worth. As a result, he had long made it a practice to restrict his frequent sexual liaisons to only those women who were unencumbered by husbands. God knew there were more than enough of them, and most were willing and eager to warm his bed. Flirtations, however, were a normal part of life amongst the ton, and his recent involvement with Elizabeth Grangerfield, whom he had known since they were both children, had been little more than that, a harmless flirtation that sprang up when she returned to England from an extended trip of more than a year. The flirtation had begun as nothing more than a few bantering remarks, admittedly with sexual overtones, exchanged between two old friends. It would never have gone further, except that one night last week Elizabeth had slipped past Jordan's butler and, when Jordan came home, he found her in his bed, all lush, naked, inviting woman. Normally, he would have hauled her out of his bed and sent her home. But that night his mind was already dulled by the brandy he'd been imbibing with friends, and while he deliberated over what to do with her, his body had overruled his sluggish mind and insisted he accept her irresistible invitation. Turning toward his horse, which was tethered to a nearby tree, Jordan glanced up at the feeble rays of sunlight that streaked the sky. There was still time to get a few hours of sleep before he began the long day of work and social engagements that would culminate late tonight at the Bildrup's ball.
chandeliers dripping with hundreds of thousands of crystals blazed above the vast mirrored ballroom where dancers attired in satins, silks, and velvets whirled in time to a lilting waltz. Pairs of French doors leading out onto the balconies were thrown open, allowing cool breezes to enter, and couples, desiring a few moments' moonlit privacy, to exit. Just beyond the furthest pair of doors, a couple stood on the balcony, their presence partially concealed by the shadows of the mansion itself, apparently unconcerned with the wild conjecture their absence from the ballroom was creating among the guests. It's disgraceful. Miss Letitia Bildrup said to the group of elegant young men and women who composed her personal retinue, casting a ferociously condemning look, liberally laced with envy, in the direction of the doors through which the couple had just exited, she added, Elizabeth Grangerfield is behaving like a strumpet, chasing after Hawthorne, with her own husband lying wounded from his duel with Hawthorne this very morning. Sir Roderick Carstairs regarded the angry Miss Bildrup with an expression of acid amusement for which he was known, and feared, by all the ton. You're right, of course, my beauty. Elizabeth ought to learn from your own example and pursue Hawthorne only in private, rather than in public. Letitia regarded him in haughty silence, but a telltale flush turned her smooth cheeks a becoming pink. Beware, Roddy. You are losing the ability to separate what is amusing from what is offensive. Not at all, my dear, I strive to be offensive. Do not liken me to Elizabeth Grangerfield, Letitia snapped in a furious underbreath. We have nothing in common. Ah, but you do. You both want Hawthorne. Which gives you something in common with six dozen other women I could name, particularly he nodded toward the beautiful red haired ballerina who was waltzing with a Russian prince on the dance floor, Elise Grandx. Although Miss Grandx seems to have gotten the best of all of you, for she is Hawthorne's new mistress. I don't believe you. Letty burst out, her blue eyes riveted on the graceful redhead who had reportedly bewitched the Spanish king and a Russian prince. Hawthorne is unattached. What are we discussing, Letty? One of the young ladies asked, turning aside from her suitors. We are discussing the fact that he has gone out on the balcony with Elizabeth Grangerfield, Letty snapped. No explanation of the word he was necessary. Amongst the ton, everyone who mattered knew he was Jordan Addison Matthew Townsend, Marquis of Lansdowne, Viscount Leeds, Viscount Reynolds. Earl Townsend of Marlow, Baron Townsend of Strelay, Richfield, and Munmart, and 12th Duke of Hawthorne. He was the stuff of which young ladies' dreams were made, tall, dark, and fatally handsome, with the devil's own charm. Amongst the younger females of the ton, it was the consensus of opinion that his shuttered grey eyes could seduce a nun or freeze an enemy in his tracks. Older females were inclined to credit the former and discard the latter, since it was well known that Jordan Townsend had dispatched hundreds of the French enemy, not with his eyes, but with his deadly skill with pistols and sabers. But regardless of their ages, all the ladies of the town were in complete agreement on one issue. A person had only to look at the Duke of Hawthorne to know that he was a man of breeding, elegance, and style, a man who was as polished as a diamond. And, frequently, just as hard. Roddy says Elise Grandx has become his mistress, Letty said, nodding toward the stunning, Titian-haired beauty who appeared to be oblivious to the Duke of Hawthorne's departure with Lady Elizabeth Grangerfield. Nonsense, said a seventeen-year-old debutante who was a stickler for propriety. If she was, he certainly wouldn't bring her here. He couldn't. He could and he would, another young lady announced her gaze glued to the French doors through which the Duke and Lady Grangerfield had just departed, as she waited eagerly for another glimpse of the legendary Duke. My mamma says Hawthorne does whatever he pleases and the devil fly with public opinion. At that moment, the object of this and dozens of similar conversations throughout the ballroom was lounging against the stone railing of the balcony gazing down into Elizabeth's glistening blue eyes with an expression of unconcealed annoyance. Your reputation is being shredded to pieces in there, Elizabeth. If you have any sense, 
You'll retire to the country with your ailing husband for a few weeks until the gossip over the duel dies down. With a brittle attempt at gaiety, Elizabeth shrugged. Gossip can't hurt me, Jordan. I'm a countess now. Bitterness crept into her voice, strangling it. Never mind that my husband is thirty years older than I. My parents have another title in the family now, which is all they wanted. There's no point in regretting the past, Jordan said, restraining his impatience with an effort. What's done is done. Why didn't you offer for me before you went off to fight that stupid war in Spain? She asked in a suffocated voice. Because, he answered brutally, I didn't want to marry you. Five years ago, Jordan had casually considered offering for her in the distant, obscure future, but he hadn't wanted a wife then any more than he did now, and nothing had been settled between them before he left for Spain. A year after his departure, Elizabeth's father, intent on adding another title to the family tree, had insisted she marry Grangerfield. When Jordan received her letter, telling him she'd been married off to Grangerfield, he'd felt no keen sense of loss. On the other hand, he'd known Elizabeth since they were in their teens, and he had harbored a certain fondness for her. Perhaps if he had been around at the time, he might have persuaded her to defy her parents and refuse old Grangerfield's suit. Or perhaps not. Like nearly all females of her social class, Elizabeth had been taught since childhood that her duty as a daughter was to marry in accordance with her parents' wishes. In any case, Jordan had not been here. Two years after his father's death, despite the fact that he hadn't produced an heir to ensure the succession, Jordan had bought a commission in the army and gone to Spain to fight against Napoleon's troops. At first his daring and courage in the face of the enemy were simply the result of a reckless dissatisfaction with his own life. Later, as he matured, the skill and knowledge he acquired in countless bloody battles kept him alive and added to his reputation as a cunning strategist and invincible opponent. Four years after departing for Spain, he resigned his commission and returned to England to resume the duties and responsibilities of a dukedom. The Jordan Townsend who had returned to England the year before was very different from the young man who had left. The first time he walked into a ballroom after his return, many of those changes were startlingly evident, in contrast to the pale faces and bored languor of other gentlemen of his class, Jordan's skin was deeply tanned, his tall body rugged and muscular, his movements brisk and authoritative and, although the legendary Hawthorne charm was still evident in his occasional lazy white smile, there was an aura about him now of a man who had confronted danger, and enjoyed it. It was an aura that women found infinitely exciting and which added tremendously to his attraction. Can you forget what we've meant to each other? Elizabeth raised her head, and before Jordan could react, she leaned up on her toes and kissed him her familiar body willing and pliant, pressing eagerly against his. His hands caught her arms in a punishing grip and he moved her away. Don't be a fool. He snapped scathingly, his long fingers biting into her arms. We were friends, nothing more. What happened between us last week was a mistake. It's over. Elizabeth tried to move against him. I can make you love me, Jordan. I know I can. You almost loved me a few years ago. And you wanted me last week. I wanted your delectable body, my sweet, he mocked with deliberate viciousness, nothing else. That's all I've ever wanted from you. I'm not going to kill your husband for you in the duel, so you can forget that scheme. You'll have to find some other fool who'll purchase your freedom for you at the point of a gun. She blanched, blinking back her tears but she didn't deny that she'd hoped he would kill her husband. I don't want my freedom, Jordan. I want you, she said in a tear-glogged voice. You may have regarded me as little more than a friend, but I've been in love with you since we were fifteen years old. The admission was made with such humble, hopeless misery that anyone but Jordan Townsend would have realized she was telling the truth, and perhaps been moved to pity her. But Jordan had long ago become a hardened skeptic where women were concerned. He responded to her painful admission of love by handing her a snowy white handkerchief. Dry your eyes, 
the hundreds of guests who surreptitiously watched their return to the ballroom a few moments later, noted that Lady Grangerfield seemed tense and left the ball at once. However, the Duke of Hawthorne looked as smoothly unperturbed as ever as he returned to the beautiful ballerina who was the latest in his long string of mistresses. And when the couple stepped onto the dance floor a few moments later, there was a glow of energy, a powerful magnetism that emanated from the beautiful, charismatic bear. Elise Grandx's lithe, fragile, Grace complimented his bold elegance, her vivid coloring was the perfect foil for his darkness, and when they moved together in a dance, they were two splendid creatures who seemed made for one another. But then that is always the way, Miss Bildrup said to her friends as they studied the pair in fascinated admiration. Hawthorne always makes the woman he is with look like his perfect mate. Well, he won't marry a common stage performer no matter how excellent they look together, said Miss Morrison. And my brother has promised to bring him to our house for a morning call this week, she added on a note of triumph. Her joy was demolished by Miss Bildrup. My mama said he plans to leave for Rosemead tomorrow. Rosemead? The other echoed blankly, her shoulders drooping. His grandmother's estate, Miss Bildrup clarified. It's to the north, beyond some godforsaken little village called Morsham.